Um, our first speaker this afternoon is Kristen Monahan. Um, she is the business analytics manager at PLOS, where she champions the decentralization and democratization of data and analysis. Prior to PLOS, she had filled various sales and operations roles at fashion accessory companies. And Kristen, if you'll come on up to the stage anytime. Um, only recently did Kristen learn the difference between hematology, hepatology, and herpetology. And for that, she is quite proud of herself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you now. Let's see. Yeah. All right, cool. Thanks for having me. We're ready. We're ready to roll. Cool. Okay. Um, so for the handful of you who are unfamiliar with PLOS, the Public Library of Science, we are a small non Access publisher. It's been around since the uh, turn of this century. Seven journals, many scientific disciplines. Uh, PLOS One is our largest um, and helped pave the path for other mega journals. So about taxonomy at PLOS. So at submission, PLOS One articles receive uh, are entirely indexed. So they receive up to 12 taxonomy terms. The remaining six journals uh, are indexed uh, at the title and abstract only and receive up to about six terms. And at publication, all journals, uh, all articles are fully indexed and we have about eight terms. So if you go to any of the PLOS journals, you'll see on the right hand side of the NAV, uh, usually eight terms per article. So in today's session, we're going to go through the exercise of determining which subjects PLOS One is seeing an increase in volume over the last few years, despite the decline in both submissions and publications uh, from 2015 through 2019. And if you didn't already know, I'm delighted to announce that 2020, we bucked the declining submission and publications trend. So we're getting a little hockey stick. Okay, so first things first, you can find our full taxonomy on GitHub. Uh, you just Google PLOS thesaurus GitHub. My favorite export is the full XLSX. Um, it shows our most up-to-date poly hierarchical list of terms, over 10,000 unique terms via 18,000 paths. And excitingly, we also have an accessible database of all of our published articles and related terms. So I use this, uh, this particular database uh, to pull full taxonomy terms for any to all of our published articles from 2002 forward. So this table here, uh, last night I pulled annual submissions for the last five years from PLOS One. So before I start doing any year over year trend analysis, I'm just gonna let my eyes do the work, see what I see what happens, see what I'm when I land on. So first I can see that Ethiopia is tagged more frequently than in years past. It just like popped out at me. So our taxonomy is such that uh, geographic locations are generally reflective of where the research is performed. So for me, without knowing if editorial and marketing have made a concerted effort to increase submissions from Ethiopia, this is interesting. But starting from the top down, public health and China makes sense given the pandemic. Behavior uh, could put to all sorts of things inclusive of animal or human behavior. Um, but you know, I can see myself starting to go down a rabbit hole of all of the things that might be interesting. So I'm gonna start, uh, I'm gonna kind of move to the next step and go to year over year growth or decline. So in SciSense, that's our business intelligence tool, that's our BI, our BI tool, um, we've got about 10,000 rows that I would need to look at to find all of the good, the trends, the really interesting trends. It seems untenable, but let's just focus on the last three years. So I started with five, scooting down to three, seeing what we can get. I can see public and occupational health uh, and China and the addition of respiratory infections, which I hadn't initially noticed in that five-year poll. 
COVID-19, SARS, that makes sense, makes an appearance in this view. But the one that caught my eye is internet. I know that PLOS One has made a concerted effort to increase emissions across engineering and technology, but is it pulling, is, are we, you know, paying off? Is that paying off? So the hunt begins. I'm looking for the internet. We have a few different terms related to the, the, the string that is the word internet. Just gonna take a look by country, see what's happening. Uh, these are by author countries, both contributing and corresponding. I, looked, I like to look for both. Um, of course, the U.S. has the most admissions. This is not a surprise. So instead, I'm going to start taking a look at uh, institutions. And surprise, surprise, the University of Gondar, uh, which I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing correctly, which is in Ethiopia, is the top submitting institution of articles that are tagged with Internet. This is very interesting. But before we go any further, <laughs> I need to acknowledge that there was, up until about 2019, an enormously missing piece of this puzzle, which is, so as PLOS and PLOS One was, was rapidly growing through the 2010s, we hadn't assigned sections in PLOS One. So we had all of these 10,000 taxonomy terms being tagged all over the place um, on, on our tens of thousands of submissions. But as um, someone else mentioned, uh, our taxonomy was not built so that each of the tiers were equally weighted. So it was impossible or nearly impossible to determine if a paper that was tagged with dogs is about organisms or about psychology or something else. So are papers tagged with the term internet appropriately categorized as computer networks? We didn't know. So we partnered with Access Innovations in 2019 um, and re-indexed all of our submissions from 2010 to 2018 with a much broader category subject level view. So now we have uh, about 200 broad categories for PLOS One authors to choose at time of submission. So we've got machine indexed uh, articles at those broad categories for the first nine years, 2019 and 2020, we have authors choosing their sections. So back to the internet. 2020 submissions. What subsections are authors choosing? So these are papers that were tagged with internet, and then the author also chose uh, public health and epidemiology, infectious diseases, healthcare, etc. Interesting. But these are only submissions, so I actually really want to see what we're looking at in terms of publications. Um, so let's look at the internet within published articles in 2019 and 2020 in public health. United States, not that surprising. Some interesting institutes come up, sort of like what I would expect, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, Johns Hopkins, um, but some other institutes that I don't see as frequently in the trend analysis that I do for PLOS and regular basis. But it's at this point, so I was, I was preparing this presentation uh, last night and I was like, oh man, <laughs> I'm going down this rabbit hole. That's really interesting. And then I remembered that the whole point is just to, to talk about trend analysis and business analysis. So while fascinating, our, a good analyst will be able to maintain and contain one's curiosity. It's tough to do, but you got to do it. So we know that we've seen an increase in submissions from Ethiopia. And aside from COVID related topics, internet took my interest. But as the person who's responsible for organization-wide reporting, you need to make friendly dashboards that other busier people can get straight to the point. So what's up, what's down, what's the outlier? Do we have enough editor coverage? How fast are we processing papers? What's normal? So I took you through this process over the last few minutes to show you how I think about building standard reports against subjects. I like to go big, and then hone in and then uh, standardize the, the widgets, the charts, the look and feel. So here is an example of 2019 published articles by author chosen subject areas, time to publish, meaning time to publish days. So if you squint, 
you can see that psychology papers were increasing in time to publish towards the end of the year. Having looked at, say, psychology papers versus mathematic papers over the last couple of years, it's not that concerning to me that psych uh, and social science papers uh, take a little bit longer than, say, microbiology. If I were to have plotted public health and epidemiology articles um, over the last two years, probably we see an increase in speed and time to publish uh, because we, we fast-tracked those COVID-19 papers. But there's also interesting miscellaneous metrics associated that you can associate with um, brought these broader categories. So time to publish um, very well could be an indication of health. Uh, it could indicate that we have um, not enough of volunteer editors handling our papers? Do we have, you know, what's the average number of papers that our editors are handling in a subject area and do we need to recruit more? In these terms by the top subsections, by public health and by uh, psychology, this just helps us drill in. So it's the combined um, um, indexing, I suppose, um, or classification of the machine aided indexing from uh, access innovations as well as the author's chosen subject areas. So we've got public health and epidemiology crossing with medical risk factors, um, psychology and emotions, public health and schools, infectious diseases, COVID-19. It makes sense. So if this were more of a, a network diagram, you'd be able to see all of the overlap, lots of Venn diagrams. And then institutes by terms is just always an interesting one for me. Um, HIV, we still, re we receive a lot of papers about HIV, but what in the pulling this table, it was interesting to me to see how frequently we receive papers about HIV from different institutions. Uh, so there might be some uh, use for editorial and marketing here in reaching out to specific institutions and specific fields and seeing if we want to do collections or something to that effect. We have editors by subsection. So, you know, here we have uh, Peter Beal in archaeology. Um, and I'm just picking some names that I know I can pronounce correctly. Um, Simon Clegg in vet veterinary science. These are how many papers they've handled in a certain amount of time. Um, but if we also kind of move on over, uh, oh, Simon, if we were to scroll down the second table that's in the middle, you would see that Simon Clegg's uh, veterinary science term most used is dogs, which is my favorite. Um, but Frank Spradley, who handles a lot of uh, OBGYN papers, um, specifically it handles papers tagged with pregnancy. Um, so do we need other editors who are handling other types of OBGYN related uh, issues? In terms of country, um, again, not that surprising because the U.S. is in here. Uh, so we have accept rates. There are things that we can build with accept rates. So by, um, you know, we have a higher accept rate for ecology papers than we do for psychology papers, or actually that's backwards. We have a higher accept rate for psychology papers than for ecology papers, uh, and a higher reject rate for economics papers than we do computer and information science papers. We can do the same kind of analysis at that indexed term level as well. Um, and I know you can't really see it sort of truncated there, but cancer treatment shows up as a pretty voluminous term um, in our published papers from, I think, I think this is still just 2020. So what is the accept reject rate of um, various concepts within these broader categories and how does that impact workflow decisions, staffing decisions, uh, marketing decisions, sales decisions. And then lastly, I just wanted to show you just to have something a little pretty, um, but definitely illegible, is we, could, we can absolutely analyze by any of these business measures, whether it's accept rate, time to first decision, number of viewers, number of editors available, countries, institutions, you name it, demographic, psychographic information, throw that all in with our taxonomy terms, and we have really interesting rates, uh, accept rates, reject rates, et cetera. So that's what I've got. Okay, thank you, Kristen. I think you kind of blew my ears back with that, but it's really, <laughs> really, really interesting. Sorry, I tried to talk slowly. <laughs> it's really interesting stuff. It's really interesting how PLOS is um, 
uh, how you are using the PLOS Texon uh, to fuel things other than just indexing. I think it's a really a great use case. Yeah. Um, and Jeffrey uh, made a comment that says, um, at the, at early in your presentation, he said, that's a really stark jump in the internet term. It is, and they were generally, that? yeah, they were generally tied to epidemiology papers, which were generally tied to coronavirus papers. So because I built this presentation to reflect an actual process that I do, um, I started with internet, realized I wasn't gonna actually find that interesting <laughs> like that much that was interesting or new um and then steered it to something that actually could be reusable by others in the organization great um uh, gonna chat with you for a few minutes while we see if there's Certainly. any other questions from the audience um <laughs> Uh, so SciSense. So I highly recommend. So we uh, use SciSense as a business intelligence tool. It's a full stack solution, meaning you can do data modeling in the back end, uh, data integration and visualization. We are moving into a more mature data management um, strategy um, and are going to be using Google BigQuery for modeling and storage, uh, and using Talent for data integration, if any of you are into that, and then Tableau. Um, we just decided to go with Tableau. Tableau has more, um, has prettier visualization. So for public facing sites, uh, it's more compelling. Uh, also, the price was good. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Okay. Um, so there's actually several questions in the chat. Um, one is, does PLOS use their own manuscript management system? We use Editorial Manager. Okay, great, thank you. Um, back to the concentration of documents with the word internet, internet in Ethiopia. Ethiopia froze yes. up just when you were starting to answer that question. <laughs> yes. Yes, I do believe that the, they are related and that the um, strife happening in Ethiopia had an impact on the number of submissions, a, a, a strangely positive impact on the number of submissions. And I think I was talking to no one when I was explaining um, that I don't think it's a plus secret, but that we are, um, well, it isn't anymore, uh, that we are, Ethiopia is on the list of our countries to nurture our relationships with. We have a lot of strong relationships with U.S. and Western European institutions, um, and we want to make sure that we are uh, representing the world appropriately. Great. Another question, when you're working for a BI metric, do you find there's one way to gen generalize that metric, like the internet term, or is it experience? To generalize the metric. Um, I'm not exactly sure what that means, but I think the, I think the answer is experience, um, but based on really supply chain operations, uh, which is my background, and, um, data management. So uh, we are looking for, uh, and if you have had any conversations with me in the last six years, I usually go back to talking about shoes. So here we go again. So if we can describe shoes as like sneakers, purple, size eight, then we can describe manuscripts in the same way with lots of different dimensions and facets. Um, so those are ways to describe the object, ways to describe the, the research article. But we know that there are key measures that we need to uh, to follow along to make sure that our processes are healthy. So time to first decision, time to assign editor, time to find reviewers. Uh-oh, here we go again. Kristen, you froze again. If you can hear me, you might want to try refreshing again or whatever it was you did last time to get back um, online. In the meantime, um, Jeffrey, did that answer your question?
Indeed, excellent. So that did answer his question. All right. We do have one really good question here that I hope Kristen can come back to answer. Okay, that's positive progress. I'll just give her a couple seconds to get back on. Come on, Kristen, you can do it. Okay. So Kristen isn't back yet, as you can see. Uh, the final question is, can you talk to the experience and ease of use of the integration between the taxonomy and Tableau? And, oh, there's Kristen. Here I am. Okay. <laughs> this is, of are. course, today is like the worst day for internet here. It's not normally this bad. Um, of course. Taxonomy and Tableau. Yes, excellent. The, the, the um, difference in usage uh, in application for between SciSense and Tableau isn't going to be that different for PLOS. Um, it, I think it would just be better uh, data visualizations through Tableau than through SciSense. Um, I also uh, am a huge fan of just basic like pivot tables and columns uh, and uh, line charts, which is pretty boring for most people. But uh, with Tableau, being able to use, say, their mapping visualization and plug on top of that taxonomy and, and be able to say, OK, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to choose, I'm going to drill into internet, I'm going to drill into computer and information sciences and be able to then see the country, heck, even the province within the country where the um, where the manuscripts are coming from, where our researchers are, where our editors are. So, you know, that those three facets of this business, authors, researchers, and editors, and being able to map the relation between them and actually be able to show our internal clients where these folks are uh, geographically should be pretty compelling and something that we couldn't do in SciSense. That's great. And it sounds like you've already got the makings of a few patients. <laughs> <Right there>. Totally. <laughs> totally. Okay, great. Thank you, Kristen, very much.